This program is brought to you by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu. This presentation is delivered by the Stanford Center for Professional Development. Hello and welcome to the Stanford Seminar on People, Computers, and Design. Today we've got as our speaker Dan Morris from Microsoft Research. And Dan is an alum of this department. He's a former student of Ken Salisbury's. And Ken has his camera here to photograph Dan to demonstrate that there is actually life after graduate school. It's in truth, people go on and, and do other things. And Dan's done a whole bunch of work at, while being at MSR. It's really prolific. And one of the projects that uh, different than Dan's going to talk about today is Dan did some work on, on collaborative search. And it was really fun at Kai this year because Dan presented the collaborative search paper with his wife. And to see a, a husband and wife dynamic duo present the paper was a lot of fun. When I asked Dan about it afterwards, he said, oh, yeah, it's the, you know, it's, I actually think collaborating with your spouse is the best possible thing you can do because you have a uh, much more trust and a uh, you know, more common ground and increased communication. He's like, this is, this is great. I really love collaborating with my spouse and would do it That's more really, again. What I actually said is there's just no real need. When you, when you live with someone for five years, you kind of like <laughs> cut away that layer of BS that you have when you work with anybody else. You're like, I don't need, I don't need to lie. Be extra nice. Though. So, so maybe Mary will be in the band, and we'll, we'll hear yeah. about the music software today. Thank you, Scott. Uh, yes, excellent. So yes, I'm Dan. Uh, today, I am going to be talking about MySong, which is a system for uh, automatic accompaniment for vocal melodies. This is work we did up at Microsoft Research with myself, Sumit Basu, who's another researcher uh, kind of from the AI and machine learning side at Microsoft, and Ian Simon, who's a student at UW um, who interned with us last summer. Um, and before I get started at all, uh, please do interrupt with questions. I really hope I don't finish this talk. I've heard the whole thing. I don't need to see the end. I give you plenty of audio up front. So please interrupt with questions anytime during the talk. And I promise if I have to cut stuff, I'll make sure you get to hear all the fun audio examples, and I'll cut the more boring stuff. So. OK, so to get us in the, uh, the spirit of participation, like I just asked you for, we're going to actually start with a little uh, an audience poll, mandatory audience participation. Scott's actually going to kick you out of the room if you don't participate uh, in this little poll. Um, so I want to show of hands here. And if you're out, people listening in the world, I want you to raise your hand just like so you feel participatory, even though I can't actually count you. So the first question I'm going to ask is, how many people in this room like music at all? Like listening to music? Yeah, all right. Excellent. So for people out in the world, I know, oh, we, oh, we even got a camera on them. That, that makes it harder for me to lie if I don't get the results I want. But the answer was basically everybody, right? People like music. OK. Now, how many of you, now be honest here, how many of you like to sing? And I don't mean you sing in a band. I don't mean you even sing karaoke. I mean, come on, once in a while you sing in the shower, you sing in the car, you uh, Sing along with commercials on TV once in a while. There we go. Yeah, hands come up slowly on this question, but hands come up. People like to sing, right? Whether they admit it or not, on some level, people like to sing. Catchy TV commercials, you can't resist singing along. You know it. So last question. This is why I bank on getting the answer I want here. I think I'm OK. So how many of you in this room would consider yourself a songwriter? I don't mean just you play an instrument. I mean you write original music. I got one. I got a couple. That's actually pretty good. I think that's because a couple of uh, so my talk circulated on the Carmel list. Is that <laughs> maybe where some of you guys came from? Um, we got a couple. A very small percentage of this room raised their hands for that question, which is great, because that means that my real-time results are 100% accurate. Real-time poll results say lots of people in the world like music. Lots of people even like to sing. Not many people ever get to write music. And it's not because we all wouldn't like writing music. It's not because we're not all creative and smart. It's because it takes a lot of years of training and experience to develop the, not just the skills, but the, just the basic vocabulary to write music, to know about chords and harmony. Um, for those of you who don't play an instrument, it's not like everybody who plays an instrument knows how to write music either, right? Lots of people play instruments for decades and are great at what they do and still don't have that fundamental vocabulary um, to even attempt songwriting. <clears throat> so the project I'm going to talk about today, my song, is, like I said, a system that creates automatic accompaniment for vocal melodies. Or in other words, this project lets people with no musical training create real sounding music just by singing into a microphone. So the target audience here 
is all of you. It's people who like to sing in the car, like to sing in the shower a little, or at least would be willing to sing in the comfort and privacy of your own home, but wouldn't otherwise ever even get a taste of creating original music. Just because you're not going to spend 10 years learning uh, an instrument, um, and you, so you might not otherwise never get to experience something like that. The goal of this project is not to help you write your Grammy-winning hit. It's not going to be an automatic songwriting machine that turns out automatic hits. But our goal is to give a little taste of authentic music creation and composition to people who would otherwise never even get a taste of that. Um, and I'll also talk, or, uh, talk a little bit later about how there's also applications of this for people who are songwriters and just kind of want a novel way to play with new songs. Um, so you may already be a little bit skeptical. Some of you may have seen uh, various kind of music for novices systems before that may have felt more like toys than uh, creative tools to create authentic music. Um, so before I do anything else, I'm going to skip right to a little bit of results and just give you a feel for what my song can do. Um, I'm going to talk about this in more detail later, um, but for now, we recently did a usability study on, that looks important, uh, on uh, my song uh, for our Kai paper where we had a whole bunch of people come in and work with my song who were exactly the target audience I'm describing. They must have liked to sing because they volunteered to come sing in a stranger's office for a user study. But if they knew, any, maybe they knew the word major and minor, maybe they played piano when they were five, but if they knew anything more than that, they were rejected from the study off the top. So exactly the target audience I'm describing, people who didn't know about chords and music theory, um, came in and worked with my song to create, uh, to create music. Um, and those are the examples I'm going to be showing you throughout the talk today. Um, the examples you'll hear, like this one, you know this song. Um, You'll, you'll know most of the songs we play today. We, did, we figured it was stressful enough for somebody to be come, come in and sing in a stranger's office. We didn't want them to also have to write music in the 10 minutes we gave them. So they sang a pop melody that they were comfortable and familiar with. But from our system's perspective, this is the totally new melody. It's never heard this before. And its job and the user's job is to come up with an accompaniment for that melody. Um, so I'm going to give you a quick glimpse of what this feels like. First, I'm going to show you the input that the first user in our user study sang. And this is really just to give you a reminder of what the whole universe of input to our system is. This is also our chestnuts R. roasting on an open fire. Jack Frost nipping. Right, you get the idea. Again, the reason I show you that is just to remind you that was the entire universe of input to our system. He's not sitting down at a keyboard and typing in musical notes or musical chords or anything. The next thing I'm going to show you is this person worked with my song, the real core of my song. It, which I'm going to talk about for most of the talk today, is a system that generates chords to accompany a vocal melody. So I'm going to now show you that what that person just sang, plus the chords that my song generated, played back as a, just at first as a really simple piano part. I call this the, the let it be piano part. If you can learn to do one thing on the piano, learn to do this. It's very versatile and can be a good party trick. Chestnuts roasting on an open fire. Jack Frost nipping at your I'm actually going to stop that again, too, because I'm going to show you one more for this audio example. Um, now what I'm going to show you is, so we've generated, we and the user, my song and the user, have generated some chords to accompany that vocal audio. We can now take those chords and give them to any number of sort of pattern-based accompaniment tools. Um, and these are things that have been around since Yamaha keyboards in 1982. Um, if, there are a number of systems where if you tell them a set of chords and you say, play this like rock, play this like jazz, they have a, a library of a billion things a rock guitar does and a billion things a jazz piano does. And a given a set of chords can string those together in pretty compelling ways to make audio from your set of chords. So what we're going to do now is we're going to take the chords from my song and fire them through a system like this called Band in a Box. It's a commercial system. You can buy it online. Um, and this is kind of my end-to-end -end picture of what this non-musically trained user made, having never used our system before, in just 10 minutes. Chestnuts roasting on an open feel like you're at the mall, December 22nd, and you're Jack at the mall. Jack Frost nipping at your nose. Yuletide carols being sung by a choir and folks dressed up like Eskimos. All right, so was that the best recording you've ever heard? I, I hope not, otherwise you have had a limited musical experience in your lifetime. <laughs> Is it going to be nominated for a Grammy? Definitely not. But there's very little doubt that that person who didn't even have the vocabulary to talk about chords created something musical in just a couple of minutes. And I would say the audio quality of that is well above the bar if you're somebody who just wanted to play with something and make a cool greeting card for mom's birthday or a little love song for Valentine's Day. 
Um, and somebody who, who would never otherwise have a way of creating something like that could actually is it, could be creating something that they uh, feel very proud of, like they've really created something musical, at, even at that level of quality. Uh, OK, so hopefully that gives you a, feel, a quick feel for what my son can do. The next thing I'm going to do before I really get started, just show you a quick snippet of video. Um, just so you, when I talk about using my song, you have a vague feel for what it looks like to work with my song. Creating music with my song begins with recording a vocal melody. A user presses the record button and sings along with a computer generated beat. He's really good, but I won't make you listen to the whole When the user stops singing, my song immediately generates a set of chords to accompany the user's voice. The user can listen to these chords as a piano accompaniment. Someday, when I'm all below and the world is cold, I will feel a glow just thinking of and the way you look tonight. Creating music with my song Sorry. begins with again. recording a vocal melody. So hopefully that gives you a quick feel for what it looks like to interact with Mustang. Yes, please, ask questions. It's a good example. Ask questions. So yes. This may be a little bit early, but is there a, sort of like a minimum level of competence or sufficiency? Here, uh, minimum level. It's always the first question. Can you, like, you need to be able to sing a little to do this, right? I, I really do want to address that question. Let's actually come back to it a little bit when I've given you a little bit more background on how this system works. Um, and then if I forget to talk about this, I think I don't have it on any of my slides, somebody make sure to ask me that question again. Either of the form, you asked it in a very nice way, um, another way of saying it, what happens if I suck at singing, right? <laughs> like, like, either way, somebody make sure to ask me that question in a few slides, OK? It's your job if nobody else does. Order choices of beat. Um, so that's also another thing I want to show you in that video. The one thing we ask before you do anything else with my song is you pick a tempo. And, and we assume that this is, you know, we, we don't ask a lot of musical knowledge from the user, but we assume it's relatively intuitive to drag a slider and you hear a, a drum track saying faster or slower. Um, and if, if, you, if you really want to know, we, we, you know you, there's no limitation on time signature. And I'm, I'm going to occasionally veer into musical terminology. I'll try to minimize it in this talk. But somebody stop me if you think I'm talking about something important and I'm using terms I shouldn't be using. Um, you can change the time signature. We make no restrictions on that. The only restriction we make is that we want to know what the tempo is and what the time signature is before you sing. The reality is that 99.99% .99 of pop music is in 4-4 and never changes tempo. So we really, this is not, does, in practice, is not at all a limiting assumption. Um, and I'll, I'll, I can get into that in a little more detail later. The other thing is that if a song does change tempo or time, it doesn't do it all the time at every measure, right? You could easily, in a, if you're actually building a big song with my song, you could record a 4-4 chunk of 30 seconds and then record another chunk at a different tempo or time, you know, if that was really a concern. But again, 99% of pop music, that's not really an issue. So. That adequate answer? Okay. Um, just curious, currently your uh, license input is human voice. What if the input is human voice plus the chords you're generating? Uh, so something else or the question is, the input right now that we're showing you is human voice. Does this same basic process work if you put in human voice? I'm actually going to stretch that into two questions. One is what happens if you put in an instrument instead of human voice. The second is what happens if you put in chords plus human voice. We don't really care if the input is human voice. It needs to be monophonic sound. If I play a guitar into my song, it works great. If I play a violin into my song, it works great. Um, you'll see the details in a second of how it actually works. It is not equipped to deal with polyphonic sound. It will get very, you get relatively confused if you play a guitar into it. You shouldn't expect to get the same chords back that you played. That's not really its job. So our signal processing doesn't assume a lot, but it assumes the sound is monophonic. Good answer? OK, excellent. Um, and also, one more blurb. I'm not going to show a live demo during the talk proper, cameras on and everything. Um, I will stay as long afterwards as people want to. If people want to try and sing, it's like pretty much good to go. It's like research prototype caliber good to go. Please please feel free to come by and, and sing afterwards. Once I figure most people will be much more comfortable singing not on camera. Um, <laughs> but we'll do as much live demo as we have time for if people can stick around afterwards. OK, excellent. Uh, so you don't want to see that. I guess. A little PowerPoint glitch never happened. Excellent. All right, so here is a little bit about what today's talk is going to look like. Yes, believe it or not, we're just getting started now. We're going to talk a little bit about how my song works, and this is going to be the part where I force you to, uh, to learn stuff about 
little taste of the machine learning and signal processing be behind my song. Uh, then we're going to talk about what I think is one of the cool contributions of this project, which is how we expose some of the, there's a machine learning system going on here I'm going to talk a lot about, how we can turn the magic numbers in that machine learning system into cool creative degrees of freedom is going to be another, what we think is a cool contribution to this project. Next thing I'm going to talk about is how we go about evaluating my song. I may never get to this part of the talk if you guys ask as many questions as I hope you do. So the one thing I want to say about this right now is just think for a second, in, in HCI in general, we're pretty good at deciding whether you can drag things from one place to another quickly. We're pretty good at um, deciding whether one interface for text entry is more efficient than another. But it's a really hard problem to decide. Have we built a good creativity tool? And I just want to kick that around in your head for a little bit. We'll come back. I'm not saying we've solved the problem, but I'll come back later, hopefully, if we have time, to how we went about evaluating this as a creativity tool. And then conclusion just means more gratuitous fun audio. OK, so let's talk first a little bit about how my song works. Um, and again, stop me for questions, especially through this more technical part of the talk. Uh, before I start talking about the system proper, I want to provide just a little bit of musical background so we're all on the same page. Um, so let's say I play piano in your typical top 40 weddings and corporate parties type of cover band. Um, and the band leader wants me to play a song I've never seen before. He's going to give me something that looks like this, which is called a lead sheet. Um, and he's going to tell me probably something about the style of the song, like we're going to play this like fast rock or slow jazz or a samba groove. Um, and I'm going to look at this piece of paper, and I'm probably going to ignore everything except for these red symbols here that represent the chords that go with the song. Um, and I might look at the lyrics a little to help follow along with the singer. Um, but for the most part, if I'm an experienced musician, these chord symbols and a little bit of hint about style contain all the information I need to make music to accompany this song. Now, I'm showing you this for two reasons. Uh, one is that we're going to be using lead sheets like this as training data for our system. Uh, and I wanted to make it clear what I'm talking about when I say lead sheets. The other reason is to convince you that if I can generate the chords to accompany a melody, I've generated the core representation that musicians can actually use to make music. So I won't say the rest of the process is mechanical. It can be a creative process. It requires a lot of training. But for the most part, if I give you chords, a musician has in his head a library of patterns. I know what to do if you say play B flat and it's a jazz, you know, a, a cool song by jazz groove. Um, so just, I'm going to treat our problem for the day as we're going to be given a melody and our job is to fill in chord symbols at each, uh, on this lead sheet. The other thing I want you to learn to take away from this lead sheet we're looking at is that pop music in general is divided into fixed units of time that we call measures. That's these little boxes here. For the most part, chord changes tend to be associated with measure boundaries. So you can grill me on this a little more later. I claim that without loss of generality, we can um, generally treat our problem as filling in chords for each one of the measures in our lead sheet. And conveniently, you saw in the video a second ago, we have somebody sing along with a click track, a drum beat, while they record. So we know where the measure boundaries are. So our problem for the day is somebody just sang something. Let's fill in chords like these at each one of the measures in this new song. All right, so the 5,000 foot overview of our system looks a little bit like this. You sing into a microphone. And we take your voice and we transform it into some representation of pitch. Now, it turns out that turning your voice into a nice, clean musical melody like this is actually still a pretty hard and unreliable problem. So we're going to use a different representation of pitch, um, which I'm going to just refer to for now as a pile of notes. We know for each measure that you sang, we have a pile of notes that you sang. And I'll get into that in more detail later. The next thing we do is we take each of those piles of notes at each measure, and we pick a sequence of chords that we think will sound good with that sequence of piles of notes. And then uh, we're going to take those chords and turn them into a, uh, a piece of audio that you can record or send to mom or play back. Um, and again, we're going to largely depend on other uh, pattern-based uh, pattern accompaniment software to do things like that. 90% of what's interesting about my song and what's novel is here in this step, generating chords from melody information. So that's 90% of what I'm going to talk about today, generating a set of chords to accompany what a user is saying. Okay. So that sounds great. How do we do that? How do we generate a set of chords to accompany something that the user sang? Uh, at its core, my song uses a hidden Markov model to represent a chord sequence and its relationship to a melody. Um, so for Markov-oriented folks, nodes in our model are, are chords, and observations are little fragments of melody. I'm going to explain all that in, the, in just a second. Yeah. I'm just a little bit confused about what looks like a histogram. 
So when you say pile of nodes, that's within each measure. That's right. Okay, and, yes. that, and are these probabilities of what they what they probably are? I will. Um, so the question is: is I, I clearly used a meaninglessly vague term, pile of notes, to refer to what a representation is. That was my way of punting it off until a little bit later. The important thing, I will talk about that in detail. The important thing, though, you highlight is right. We we know whatever this representation is that I'm going to explain. We know we have one for each measure. We know where measures start and stop. We can chunk the audio into measure chunks of audio, and this representation that we build is per measure. Make sense? Okay. So here comes the um, informative and educational portion of the talk. Um, I just said we used a hidden Markov model. I'm going to assume that we have a mixed audience who may not all be familiar with hidden Markov models. So we're going to do a little tutorial, uh, a super quick intro on hidden Markov models, so we can kind of all understand this on the same level. Um, so essentially, a hidden Markov model is a sequence of nodes. Uh, each of which is going to have some discrete value. And this is often, although not necessarily, a series of discrete uh, steps in time. Um, and the typical problem we want to solve with a hidden Markov model is, what was going on at each of these steps in the sequence? Or in other words, what's the value in each one of these little circles? Now, another key aspect of a hidden Markov model is that, although I don't know what the value is in each one of the circles, that's what I'm trying to figure out. That's our job. I know something about each of these nodes. So for example, in the case of my song, I don't know what chords go in each of these blue circles. That's the problem I'm trying to solve. But I know what the user sang. That tells me something about the chords in each one of the blue circles. Um, so this all hopefully so far sounds pretty straightforward, but not very helpful. All I've shown you is a bunch of circles and arrows. Um, let's ask a couple, now, now we're learning about hidden Markov models. Let's ask some very practical questions about hidden Markov models. First of all, what does a hidden Markov model do for me? Well, it turns out, you'll see at the very end of this talk, if I can fill in some necessary information, there are algorithms, uh, standard algorithms, you can look them up on Wikipedia, for filling in these nodes, given a whole bunch of information, for finding the best sequence of states. I'll get to that in a second. But that's really what a hidden Markov model is going to do some magic for me by, to fill in those uh, unknown states. But of course, the real practical question, what does a hidden Markov model want from me? if it's going to solve this very hard problem of filling in all these unknown states, which are chords in my song. What is, sounds too good to be true, right? What do I have to give my hidden Markov model if it's actually going to tell me what the best chords are in each one of those blue circles? So it turns out there are four things the hidden Markov model wants from me if it's going to solve this very hard and important problem of filling in the blue circles or filling in the chords. The first thing I have to tell my hidden Markov model is, what are the choices for possible states at each node? So for the, the example of my song, um, this is, what are all the possible chords in the universe? And this is typically part of defining your problem. I write down or look in my database and find all the possible, I decide what chords there are in the universe. Right? Defining these possible states is kind of part of your problem specification. Second thing I have to tell my hidden Markov model is, what are the probabilities of each of these possible states following each one of the other possible states? So if I tell you that one of these blue circles has an A minor in it, I just tell you that. What's the probability that the next blue circle has a C major in it, for example? I'm going to have to tell my hidden Markov model this. The third thing of four that I have to tell my hidden Markov model is, given a particular value in each one of the blue circles, what's the probability of seeing a particular pile of notes in the red circle that goes with it? So I need to give my hidden Markov model some way of saying, if you tell me what a chord is, like say an A minor in the blue circle, I need a way of evaluating how likely a certain pile of notes is in the red circles. The fourth thing, of course, that I need to tell my hidden Markov model is, what are the observations? Or in other words, what do the user actually sing? Right? So summary, these are the four things a hidden Markov model wants from me if it's going to solve this hard problem for me and do all this magic. You're only looking at one state worth of history, so you don't look back at the previous two or three states. The question is, are we using only one state of history? Yes. Yeah, so this is a, we are using a first order Markov model, which means explicitly, each chord only depends on the one before and after it. Um, implicitly, I mean, if I change one chord, a chord 10 nodes away might change by propagation, but there's no explicit dependence. Now, if you ask me later, like, what are the things I'd love to do next with my song? Um, largely, modeling higher order dependencies in a chord sequence would be a great problem for us to work on next. And largely, that's a problem. I, I'll explain to you how we train this Markov model in a minute. Um, if I had a, a million dollars to buy training data and had a, a billions of lead sheets that the whole, you know, if the music industry would give me free lead sheets to work on this, that would be a great thing to explore. Um, turns out you need a lot more data to explore higher order dependencies. OK, so these are a reminder. These are the four things that my hidden Markov model wants from me if it's going to do useful stuff for me. I told you how we get the possible states. Let's ask, where do these transition and observation probabilities come from? 
So our general approach to finding these probabilities is going to be entirely data driven. Um, that is, we're going to take a big database of melodies and the chords that go with them and use that to train our system uh, to generate good chords for new melodies or to learn all of these probabilities. Um, now I should highlight, this is actually a design choice here. We could have sat down with a bunch of knowledgeable and experienced musicians um, and had them code or write down rules that govern transitions among chords, right? And for a handful of chord sequences, musicians actually might be pretty good at this. We actually don't know how good this would work. Um, there's a couple of reasons why we didn't do it this way. Um, one, of course, it'd, it'd be much harder to publish our paper if we did something like that. Our approach, the data-driven approach is much more interesting. Better reasons include, um, it actually, there's a lot of transitions. We have a lot of possible chords, and it would take musicians a really long time. Like, for the most common 10 chords in a database, musicians would probably do a pretty good job coming to agreement on how likely a C major is the transition to a G major. When you got into more obscure chords, which we really need, we need that whole transition matrix to be filled in, it would actually take forever and be um, very difficult for musicians to come up with agreement quantitatively on that transition matrix. The other nice thing about this data-driven approach is if we come across more data later, or if we decide we want to learn um, these transition probabilities for a whole new genre of music, we can literally just replace our whole database and run all our MATLAB scripts again. Um, so I'll see, you'll see in a second that we've trained on a database of kind of like pop rock mix, pop rock R&B jazz mix-ish stuff. If we decide that we want to learn the rules of harmony for a country, we need a database of country music, we pop it in, we run all the same code again, and nothing else changes. So this is a really big advantage of a purely data-driven approach. Yes, what's up? So Dan, in natural language, there are a number of, in natural language processing, there are a bunch of cases where a purely data-driven approach clearly scales better than a purely heuristic-driven approach. But a mostly data-driven approach does a lot better if you offer it a few insights to start with. Do you think that's the case here also? Right. Um, I, I forget whether people out there in the world can hear you, so I'm going to repeat the questions. If that gets annoying and you just let somebody tell, tell me not to, but the question is, um, is, is there some in between that might be more, um, more practical and more effective? Rather than being entirely data-driven or entirely heuristic-driven, -driv heuristic is there a mostly data-driven approach? Um, I would argue so for the, um, the casual user of a system like this. I think it's really great that we are able to um, we quickly learn pretty good rules and can generate pretty good chords. I actually think a really cool possibility is to take those transition matrices and not, I mean, I could go in and edit them and decide that I, you know, I as the developer of my song could decide, I think these rules aren't quite right. I personally don't think I could do much better than the data, but maybe I could edit them a little. But what's really cool is if we can find the right interactions, this is something we haven't really explored yet, I could show you that transition matrix and let you paint on it or lets you adjust it. I mean, I don't want the average user to open an Excel spreadsheet with the transition matrix in it. That would be sort of useless. But I think actually a really interesting area here is can we expose those probability tables in an intuitive way to users to actually let them edit it, to say, These, this chord transition is happening too much, this one too, too, uh, isn't happening enough, and that kind of thing. That's a really interesting possibility that would be somewhere in between. So you might imagine I give you an entirely data-driven version of my song, and then you can tailor and customize it in an intuitive way for your song or for your whole musical experience? Are you going to show the, uh, the actual user interface a little bit more? Uh, uh, I mean, maybe you're going to show the user interface a little bit more, but can you do this like in the song while you're, you know, once, it's, once you have it, is there, are there like knobs that you can tweak to change the chords? There are a couple of, there, that's really important to us actually because um, the question is, are there a couple of knobs you can tweak to change the chords once you've recorded a song? And even assuming you're, you're the kind of non-musically trained user. Um, and that's really important to us, because I'll talk about this more in a second, but it's cool if you sing into a microphone and get the best sequence of, best sequence of chords back. Um, but it's not really that much fun. It's not that creative an experience. It takes 10 seconds, right? It's a lot cooler if I can give you some knobs to actually manipulate and explore those the way a musician would. Um, and we do, in fact, that's really important to us. And that's something that we will, I will talk about more in a second. There are a couple of knobs that let you manipulate the actual chords. Um, that everything is just that it can be described in probabilistic terms. Um, I, I have sort of a counter hypothesis in my head, which is that chord transitions have more to do with the content of what you're singing than than they do, uh, you know, some probability transition <laughs> matrix that you would describe. Do you have a sense for how often when it messes up, it's because it it doesn't understand really? what the content is? Or? Well, um, that was a complicated question, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to punt on repeating it. But um, the, when you say content, I mean, the, we learn two sets of rules. We learn transitions, and we learn a probability of m a chunk of melody given chords. So when you say content in terms of melody, that is learned from the database. Now, in terms of like emotional content of the lyrics, for example, 
Clearly, we don't learn that from our database. Or, I mean, I hope maybe, maybe in, in 10 years, the next version of my son will have that when natural language processing is solved. Um, but uh, for now, we don't learn stuff like that. And that's actually that. And that's, it's great that your question followed Bob's question, because that's exactly why, another reason why we want to put some control over the chords in the hands of the user. Because the user, that's what's fun about making music, right? Your, your job, your task, if you're the user of this, is to come up with a set of chords and a backing track that emotionally and musically matches what you sang. Only you really know that. The best we can do is to come up with the mathematically optimal sequence of chords, which may be the right thing and may even not be the musically best sequence of chords. So the part of what's really important here is to put that in the user's hands. And until natural language processing is solved, my answer to that will always be, let's put more control over the chords in the user's hands. So, One more question. Yeah, uh, uh, given if I sing the same song twice to MA, is it deterministic? Good question. If I sing the same song twice, um, is it deterministic? <coughs> right now, the model is deterministic. Um, so in principle, if you play the way, same wave file into it twice, you will get the same chords back. It's actually not very hard for us to sample the, the probabilities and, and like once in a while pick the second best chord. Um, in practice, I'm going to talk about the pitch tracking a little bit, the signal processing later. Like, we're sufficiently sensitive, for better or for worse, to minor differences in pitch that unless you're a robot and singing exactly sample for sample the same thing in twice, in practice, because of tiny changes in your voice and tiny changes in our pitch tracking, you won't get the same thing back twice. So um, another overriding principle of using my song is it only takes you a few seconds to sing. If you don't like it, press clear and go again. And that's, like, that's important. And you will get something different back the next time. Um, OK, so the summary of this slide is we're doing everything heuristically driven, uh, data driven, sorry. Um, and you'll see that with one very, 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 very tiny exception that I'll highlight later, this means that in all the product and all the stuff I'm talking about, there are zero lines of code in my song that have musical rules in them. There is no if C major, then blah. Right? There are zero musical heuristics embedded in my song. OK, so what do our training data look like for this system? Um, we have about 300 lead sheets. Uh, that's, again, vocal melodies with, and the chords that go with them. And this is kind of a top 40 mix. It's, it's a Western pop-ish mix of some classic rock, some rock, some R&B, pop, country. Um, that kind of thing. Um, turns out 300 is, is not that many. We'd love to have more. The music publishing industry has made it, has done a great job <coughs> making it very, very hard to get lead sheets like this in a useful symbolic format. So if anybody has a pile of 1,000 lead sheets in a useful digital format, please email me as soon as you can. Um, OK, so how do we process that database of lead sheets uh, to build the transition and observation probabilities that I talked about? Um, I'm going to very quickly do a couple of bullets that are like, if you're not a musician, you can like space out for a second. I just want to quell a couple of concerns that musicians usually have. Just explain a couple things going to cheat on explaining all the musical terms. Um, we first take all the chords in the database and we convert them to five basic chord types. Um, 300 lead sheets is just not enough to learn rules for every possible chord that you can come up with in a database. Um, so we m meaningfully scrunch all them down to five basic types. So for those of you who are musicians, the total number of chords in our dictionary is 5 types times 12 roots is 60 chords. Um, the next thing we do is we transpose every song in our database into one key. Um, there's absolutely no reason to think that the rules of harmonization are different in the key of A than they are in C. So we'd be wasting training data if we learned different rules for different keys. Um, I will highlight later, we make absolutely no assumptions about what, user, what key the user is going to sing in. That's, we will generalize this later, so we're not losing any flexibility here. We're just making efficient use of our training data. OK, so now I have all these lead sheets crunched into five chord types, crunched into one key. Now all I'm going to do is I'm going to count the number of transitions from every chord to every other chord in my entire database. So how many times in the entire database did a C major, was a C major followed by a C minor? <coughs> and this is actually going to, right there, that simply give me all the transition probabilities that I need for my markup model. If I normalize a row of this table, it's exactly what I told you we needed for our transition probabilities. right? If I normalize that row, tells me what's the probability of a C major transitioning to a C minor. And similarly, in order to get the observation probabilities that we need, we're going to count the total duration of each melody note occurring while each chord is playing. So I look at all the C major chords in my database, and I say, how many milliseconds, or a, a, a time unit that I won't get into a lot of detail on, but how many milliseconds was the note C playing on top of that C major chord? And how many milliseconds was the note F? playing on top of that C major chord. Um, and this is going to give me, this is exactly the representation that we'll want to use. You'll see how we use this in a second um, to represent melody uh, on top of a chord. So that gives us the 
two most complicated things that our hidden Markov model wanted from us if it was going to do something useful. So again, this is the rundown of what a hidden Markov model wants from us. We, I told you we just tell it the possible states. I just explained the transition and observation probabilities. The next thing, of course, we need to do is tell our Markov model what the user actually sang. That's the next chunk. That's going to be my brief tour through the signal processing in my song. Do you have any questions now on the probability stuff? Oh, of course we do. Excellent. I was wondering, if you have a lack of data, and you can sure just take existing chunks, stripping out the voice, keep the instrumental, and just sort of make an inference about the melody, an inference about the chords. And it's be kind of noisy, but get more of that, maybe that can help. So the question is, I, I, I seem um, sad and bitter about only having 300 lead sheets for training data. Could we use, I mean, there's a infinite repository of audio out there. Could we use that? Um, to, to, to build our training data. You know, in principle, we could. Um, we, there are, I think, about eight separate research problems on the way from audio data to this kind of training data to even get reasonable approximations of melody and chords. And we need to know where measures start and stop. And to get even reasonable, all of those problems are not un 0% solved. But I'd say all of those problems are about, um, there's karma folks in the audience, right? Do we have, do we have a, a guess? I'd say they're 70% solved, right? There's a lot of research in pitch tracking and automatically extracting chords, and, um, but none of them are so reliable that we can really even get, I think, when you put them all together, it would be too noisy to use for this kind of training. That's my impression anyway. If you want to try it, I would love. If, if you want to send me lead sheets, I'll try them. I won't ask where they came from. If you, <laughs> uh, <coughs> do you use only the vocal melodies in your lead sheets? Uh, don't they include any uh, instrumental sections? Do we, so the question is, do we use only the vocal melody? And we use the chord, the chord symbols and the vocal melody. The question is, sometimes if you buy a piano book at the piano store, it has a piano part maybe and maybe a guitar part in musical notation. Um, we don't really use that for anything right now. We assume that what we really want from that is chords. Um, so we're not really doing anything in terms of how to actually, given a C major, how to play a piano part on top of that. We treat it as a separate problem that is best solved by having a giant library of things a piano does in a C major. In our experience, that actually gives you a pretty compelling result. Learning to generate accompaniments for an instrument on top of a chord is also very interesting, but also, I think, a separate research problem. So you made the comment that uh, you have no reason to think uh, that chord transition probabilities are you know, related to key. Um, <laughs> is this based on analysis of the data, or is this a, just a hunch? Because my hunch is the opposite, that I think key matters. Um, the question is, we make the assumption that it's OK to squelch all our data down into one key. Um, <clears throat> we don't have enough data to statistically say one way or the other. Is that really true? Um, there are probably some dependencies due to quirky things in music, like the fact that a guitar is fingered a certain way. So there might be chords that are more, you know, that in, in E minor, that a guitar is played in one way. I think I, these, are, these are excellent uh, questions from musicians. I, I think it's approximately equal. Um, across all keys. And again, we, when I say across all keys, I mean like after correcting for key that like, again, for musical people, the, trans the probability of transitioning from one to five, we assume is pretty much the same in all keys. And if that's not true, I would expect it to be so small as to be not too significant. And if, it's, and, if, and if we're losing something there, then we're losing something there. We don't have nearly enough data to cut our data down by a factor of 12 and really handle every key separately. Ask that question. Also, look if it changes depending on musical style. So that's a great sort of pure musicology question, and I don't have the answer to that. And again, if I had twenty thousand lead sheets, it'd be really interesting to know statistically in pop music is E minor fundamentally different than D minor. There's a significant uh, uh, difference between at least major and minor keys. So yes, excellent. That's an excellent point. He points out that there are clearly differences between major and minor keys. I've only talked about twelve keys, um, and I'll definitely talk about that in a little bit. Excellent point. Now we've got two things that you have to make me come back to. We've got what happens if I'm a bad singer and how do we handle major and minor. Um, so let's talk about the observations a little bit. And again, this is going to be our quick tour through. Now you have to learn, you've now learned a little bit of machine learning. We're now going to learn a little bit of, uh, of signal processing to understand how we actually give the user's voice to this Markov model. Okay, so this is, I'm just reminding you, this is really what the input to our system looks like. We have raw audio. The only thing that we know about that raw audio is we know where measures start and stop because, again, the user sang along with the drum beat. So what we really have is raw audio for each measure. So here's one thing we might do. We might take that and transcribe it into the same kind of nice musical melody that we have in our database. right? Wouldn't that be convenient? It's always nice if your data online is the same kind of thing as the data in your training database. But as I mentioned earlier, this is actually still a really hard problem. And again, I'd put it in about the 70% solved Bank. Um, it's even for a great singer, it's really hard to infer the actual intended musical 
pitch and rhythm um, from raw audio. So again, um, we're actually going to punt on that a little bit. And we're going to say, what would it look like if I just took a histogram of the frequencies the user sang during each measure? Um, I'll show you how we compute this later, but I think you can guess already it's going to be a lot less of a hard problem than actually determining um, a nice, pretty melody. Um, and it also turns out this, this approach of not trying to figure out, did you sing an eighth note here? Did you sing a sixteenth note there? It's going to be a lot more robust to minor pitch and timing errors, either in the singing or in our pitch tracking. Um, so using this very broad statistical representation of what you might have sang is um, much more robust. Of course, this comes at a cost. We are throwing away a lot of information here. And I, I, I think every assumption I make upsets some of the musicians in the audience. So here's a big one that I'm going to upset a lot of musicians with. We're throwing away all the information about timing of notes. So if you sang a C in the first half of the measure, we're assuming for purposes of harmonization, that's the same as singing a C in the second half of the measure. Um, if you sang two eighth notes, and that is, uh, yeah, if you sang two uh, little bits of C, we assume that's exactly the same as if you sang those two bits of C but you know, at the same time but a little longer. Um, so all timing and rhythm information is getting thrown away here. Now this, we think, is well, uh, well worth it because this is so much more robust to representation and so much easier to compute. Um, it remains to be seen musically whether we're really losing information there, whether if we really looked at the timing of individual notes, that would actually tell us something about what good chords might be. Oh, I didn't even get any questions. I thought for sure I was going to get angry rants and like musicians shaking their heads. And I, I, I promise not to be an angry rant. <laughs> when you say timing to me, there's a distinction between timing as in sequence as or versus the length of time. That's an excellent point. That we throw both of those things away. The question is, when I said that, <laughs> we threw away. We, we threw all, all we're keeping really is the how much total duration of each pitch, each musical note did you sing in that measure. That means if a C comes, bef if you sing half the measure C and then half the measure E, for right now that is exactly the same as doing this the other way around. There are very good arguments why that is not. We, I, I believe we are throwing some information away there. And this is the kind of thing where at some point you say, like, it would be so much harder a problem if we tried to keep that information that we're punting on that right now. But that's another great area for looking into in the future is how can we actually incorporate information about um, note sequence and note timing that affects harmonization. OK, so this is my one slide on signal processing. How do we get from raw waveform to that pitch histogram that I just showed you? So again, we start with a raw audio waveform. This is actually the, um, the waveform from that Christmas song that you heard at the beginning of the talk. And I'll explain why I picked that one in a second. What we're going to do is we're actually going to take little tiny, tiny chunks of that waveform, 40 millisecond chunks, it so turns out. Um, and we're going to look at each of those individually. And so here you see I've grabbed the audio from just 40 milliseconds from our raw audio track. Now what we're going to do is for, that little, for each one of those little 40 millisecond chunks, we're going to take a Fourier transform, which tells us what frequencies were present in that 40 millisecond chunk, and use that to build a power spectrum. And again, this is, really, this is a summary of what frequencies seem to be present a lot in the voice in that spectrum. And of course, human voice is really complicated. This is never, you know, just because you're singing, a, even if you're a great singer singing a C, this never looks like, bam, big line at C. It always looks a little complicated. Um, and this is a real simplification. But basically, what we're doing is we're going to take that power spectrum in each 40 millisecond chunk, and we're going to say, what was the biggest point on that power spectrum? We're going to say that's the biggest frequency in this 40 millisecond chunk. So that's probably the frequency you probably meant to be singing in that 40 millisecond window. Then what we're going to do is we're going to take all of those little numbers. So each 40 millisecond window gives us one frequency that we think you were singing. And we are going to just, um, this gives us a big pitch sequence like this. So this is each one of the highest frequencies for each 40 millisecond chunk. Now again, this is um, the guy who sang the Christmas song at the beginning of the talk. He is a really good singer, right? But you see, it's not like these are like perfect looking um, horizontal lines that start and stop nicely, right? It turns out human voice, even at the pitch sequence level, is really complex. You can see it wavering up and down a little bit there, and who knows what was going on there, right? Um, and this is, exact, this is a great illustration of why it's so hard to extract a musical melody from a pitch sequence, because even a great singer, who knows? Like, if you can tell me exactly where a note started and stopped down to the window level there, you are a smarter man than I. Um, because that's actually a very complicated sequence of pitches. Then we're going to take that um, pitch sequence, and roughly speaking, we're going to round each one of those pitches off to the nearest musical note. Um, we actually don't do exactly that. We actually find a, we assume you might start halfway between two keys. We don't want to make any assumptions that you exactly nail a musical key. So we actually find a, a global shift that puts the whole thing as close to a musical key as it can. And after we do that, 
we round everything off to a musical note. And here goes another assumption I'm going to throw out there to um, make musicians mad. We're going to throw away information about octave now also. We're going to assume that for purposes of harmonization, a, if you sing a G sharp and one octave, it's the same as singing a G sharp and another octave, right? So we end up with, there's 12 musical notes. We now have um, 12 horizontal lines here. And this is the, our approximate note sequence based on those pitches of what this person sang. And again, great singer. It's pretty clear he was singing C sharp for this part of the, uh, the song. You'll see there's a few C's and D's in there that probably aren't really what he meant. That's a, probably, I would consider that a mistake on our part. If a human listener listened to that, he'd probably say, yep, that's all C sharp. Um, but again, because we're taking such an approximate statistical representation, there's so many C sharps there that the fact that there's one or two C's and D's, not a big deal. Um, so again, we really benefit from the robustness and simplicity of our representation. OK, reminder, these were all the things our hidden Markov model wants from us. Hopefully, I've shown you now how we can get each of those four things. Now, I go to Wikipedia. I look up how do, if I give all these things to a hidden Markov model, how do, it, how do I get the best sequence of states or the best sequence of chords out of it? Um, and it turns out there's an algorithm called the Viterbi algorithm that just does this for you as long as you give it all these things. The hidden Markov model works its magic, and we get the mathematically optimal sequence of chords um, through this song. That makes sense? And that's going to wrap up my technical description. So if you have technical questions, ask them now. And actually, and I, I will actually, this is, this is when I wanted to address your question about what happens if you're a real bad singer. So I'll take that now. Um, so we are, um, so as you can see, we're pretty robust because of this simple representation to minor pitch errors. This isn't really a question of good singer or bad singer. This is just like if you waver in and out of a note a little bit, as long as most of the time you sing the note you meant to sing, um, we do pretty well. Um, we, if you start halfway between two keys, that's OK, because we shift your voice internally to the nearest musical key. And that's OK, too. Um, if you absolutely can't produce any coherent sequence of pitches, we have not yet developed the mind reading module for my song. And we can't read your mind. Um, so certainly, there is some bar of being able to mostly sing the notes you meant to sing, one second, um, in order to do this. Now, there's an interesting, um, we learned in our user studies, there's a very interesting psychological phenomenon that the people who really can't produce pitches at all um, are also much less sensitive to what they hear back when you play back. <laughs> uh, so usually, if somebody totally, totally can't sing, they sing, they press stop, they hear their voice with the piano and some drums, and they're like, whoa, I made music, and that's fantastic, right? <laughs> and you know, honestly, at the end of the day, that's what we want. We want to give people a sense that they made something they couldn't make before. So while that is not as technically exciting, um, you know, th that's part of what we're going for. And the other thing that happens there, the Markov model implicitly if you sing pitches where it really can't, you're all over the place, and it looks like it's kind of an even mix of pitches, and it can't really tell what you sang, it implicitly relies a lot more on the chord transitions. So if you bang on the microphone, or, um, or if you speak into the microphone something that's not musical, or you're just a really, really terrible singer, um, you will get back a familiar and friendly sequence of Western chords, which you can then use with all the things I'm going to talk about in the next section of the talk about how you can manipulate those chords, even if you don't really know what chords are. You can still do that and have a good time with it. Um, so in a sense, short of reading your mind, that's pretty much the best we can do if you really can't sing. Um, so we're pretty happy with that. That is about the longest answer I could possibly give to your question. Does that answer you pretty clearly? Excellent. Do you have another question, Bob? The longer you sing, the harder it is to, the harder it may be to maintain the same uh, key. And often people, you know, the longer the phrase is, they'll go, but their key will shift sort of sharper, flat, or may sort of waver over time. Yep. Is there any way of like tracking that? Yes. Okay. So the question is, um, even a good singer. So you'll remember, you're not singing along with music. You're singing along with a drum beat. And even a good singer, unless you truly have perfect pitch, it's very hard to stay in key for even 20 seconds, right? Um, so, so there's a couple of things we do to make that. And we do assume, like, if you are truly wandering from one key to another, that's a real problem for us. Um, we do a couple of things to mitigate that. One is that um, I didn't talk about this at all, but we don't actually just find a global shift of all the frequencies to the nearest musical note. We actually use a Kalman filtering approach that's sort of like not that interesting and a little beyond the scope of this talk. But we do a little correction for minor drifts of your key center in and out of key. And that works pretty well for um, you know, uh, amateur to good singers who <coughs> are naturally going to waver in and out of key a little bit. If you totally fall apart, um, that's where we'd say press clear and try again. Um, but uh, and another thing we do that I think is important here is um, if you're actually using my song, the real model that I would suggest to anyone using it is make your song, get some chords you like. If you press record a second time, you won't change the chords. You'll be singing back over it and recording a new vocal track. And everybody, whether you're a novice singer or a pro singer, 
will sing a hundred times better the second time when you're actually singing along with chords than you did the first time when you sang along with the drum track. Um, so as long as you can be close enough to help us get chords the first time, even if your vocal track was bad, you'll, you'll do better the second time. Um, and the last thing I'd say on that point is that if you're actually using my song in the real, like, you know, if, if you wanted to use my song to build a whole song, like a five minute song, you would never sing along with a drum beat for five minutes. That would be the most non-musical and uncomfortable experience you could imagine. Um, typically, if you're a you know, songwriter working on a song, you tend to work on a song in logical chunks anyway. You work on a verse, and then you work on a chorus, and then maybe there's a bridge, and there's some instrumental chunk. Um, we would imagine that anybody using my song to really make a song would work in exactly that way. You'd sing your 20 second verse, presumably during that time you could stay on key enough for our common filter to help recover you, and then you'd go and work on the chorus, and then you'd work on another verse. So we expect you'd never be singing so long at once that it would really be a tremendous problem. I'm actually, I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna get to your question in just a second. Oh, actually, I'll take your question now. I have a little bit more to talk about. about measures in which they're not singing at all. In those measures, is it entirely about the chord transitions? So the question is what happens if you don't sing at all in a measure, and yeah, for the most part, if um, that's the same thing as if I just speak or there's no real uh, discernible pitch, then it will be entirely dependent on the chord sequence. And of course, that's really common in music, right? It's, uh, some probably more, maybe even half of measures that you sing in a chunk of melody are empty, and that's fine. Well, you know, the chord sequence will determine what gets chosen there. Can you give me visual feedback as to how the computer is interpreting what? Um, do we give you visual feedback? Um, we don't. We try not to get into the business at all of really showing you the pitch we determine because we don't really determine a sequence of pitches, right? The visual feedback we give you, well, right now we don't give you any visual feedback. In kind of a nicer version of my song that I'm not showing right now, we, we might give you um, feedback to let you know, like we want to give you something so you know the microphone's on, right? You know there's that awkwardness when you do something with a computer and you're not really sure whether it's even listening to you at all. So some representation of I sang or I didn't sing is actually goes a really long way to making you feel like at least it's listening. We don't try to give you any kind of pitch representation because we don't, we don't have it. So. Um, okay, there's one tiny hitch in this technical description that I didn't get to. Um, I told you that we scrunched our entire database into one key, but we also don't want the user to necessarily have to sing in that key. It doesn't even matter what that key is. Um, so what we actually do, everything I described runs in like two milliseconds. So what we actually do when you sing a song is we run that entire procedure, the whole thing I just talked about, 12 times. Once for each musical key, we shift our entire database by a half step every time and try all 12 keys, whichever one, the, the Markov model tells us what the best sequence of chords was and how well it fit. So um, we did this whole thing 12 times, and whichever uh, key seemed to fit, seemed to generate a chord sequence that fits your voice, voice the best, that's the key we choose. Um, and that actually has turned out to be a really robust approach for doing this. OK, now um, we've gotten through the uh, technical and informative part. I'm going to play you some more fun audio clips for a second. Um, so again, I'm just going to play you a little clip of input just to kind of remind you these are non-musically trained users from our user study. A little snippet of input um, just to remind you what my Fish song saw. Fish gotta swim, birds gotta fly. Get the idea? I'm going to skip the piano part now and just again show you kind of end-to-end -end output. This is what our non-musically trained user made. Fish gotta swim, birds gotta fly. I gotta Do one more now. Again, a little quick snippet of input. My loneliness is killing me, and now I must confess. I'm going to play you the uh, again the end to end output, and this one is really interesting. So, a, pri a emotional prize for anybody who can tell me why I'm so proud of this particular example. My loneliness is killing me, and now I must confess I still believe, still believe. When I'm not with you, I lose my mind. Give me. There's actually two reasons I'm actually really proud of that example. Um, so one is obviously that guy, you know, that guy's a great test case um, because his pitch is actually really good. Um, you know, it's really hard to tell. We're not used to listening to try to say, is somebody's pitch good versus are they a good singer? He's a regular guy. He's not like, is he the best singer in the world? No. He's like a regular guy who sounds like he might sing karaoke once in a row, right? His pitch actually is actually pretty good, which is the best case for demoing my song. Because a, a per li listener who's not looking at a pitch track is like, that guy doesn't seem like a great singer. But my song does great on him because his pitch is actually really good. The other thing that's really interesting about that one, um, my song has never seen any of these songs before. There's absolutely no reason why it should be able to generate the original chords to the song. We told people in this user study, um, imagine you're doing a remake of your favorite song and don't really try to get to the original. Now, of course, there's some bias in their mind. They're going to be pretty happy if they get chords that sound like the song they're used to. Um, 
that was exactly, and there's one other example I'll show you that does this. That was exactly the original, the original sequence of chords for Hit Me Baby One More Time, which is a powerful statement about the simplicity of popular music in 2008. <laughs> um, more than anything about my song, because it has no reason to be able to do that, other than the fact that the user does have a couple sliders and is in his head whether we tell him to or not, is trying to get that chord sequence. Okay, um, I'm gonna t so this is now officially the last section of the talk, as expected. I was, I was I, glad you guys asked a lot of questions. I didn't want to um, get through the whole talk. So I'm going to do this section on exposing learning parameters and then basically take questions after that. We usually wrap up like an hour is normal length for this session. Is that about right? Yeah? yeah we, okay. uh, we've got the room till 2. Okay. Yeah, that, that sounds, sounds about right. right. Okay. So I have um, now shown you, and hopefully uh, you understand, how we can find the mathematically optimal sequence of chords for a given melody. Um, so that's pretty cool. The results are usually pretty good. It's not clear, though, that a Markov model's idea of the, the best chords is really all that musical. It doesn't mean it's the musically best sequence of chords. It just means it's, in some mathematical sense, the best sequence of chords. Um, and in fact, there's lots of good chord sequences to go with a melody, right? Um, a musician can sit down with the melody, and you tell him, try, try accompanying this five different ways, he'll come up with five different sets of chords that are all, quote unquote, the right answer. Um, so just picking one to give back to the user is a little bit arbitrary. On top of that, um, what I showed you so far takes like 10 seconds to do. It isn't necessarily, it doesn't feel that creative. I mean, it's cool. I sang into a microphone and it gave me music back. And hopefully I've convinced you that the output is not Grammy winning, but it's, it's musical output, but it's still not a truly creative experience. Um, wouldn't it be that much more fun and that much more musical um, if we could actually put the user in more control of what, are, what actually comes out of my song? Um, since, again, a songwriter doesn't just um, sit down like a robot and use his internal robotic chord generator to come up with chords, right? He's going to experiment with different chords and try different things. We'd like to give a piece of that experience to the non-musically trained user. So we'd like the user to have some flexible interactive control over the chords. We'd also like the user not to have to know what chords are and not to have to know what a Markov model is. Those are two important constraints here. Um, so let's step back and look at the system we have. How can we get there? Um, Anybody who explains to you what their um, machine learning system does, they lied to you a little bit. Every, every, t every talk you see that has a machine learning system in it, there's always some magic numbers, right? That's, how, that's the reality with machine learning or computer vision or anything like that. There's always some magic numbers. My song is no exception. Um, machine learning systems typically use some kind of hard-coded number, right? Whoever is sitting down, the programmer, has a pound to find somewhere in his code. He tries 27 different values and finds the one that works with the lo seeing a reasonable set of examples, and that's the number that ships with the product, right? That, or, or whatever. I mean, obviously, this is an oversimplification, but there's a lot of magic numbers in any system like this that's claiming to simplify something really complicated to something really simple. Wouldn't it be nice if we could, in this case, wouldn't it be great if we could let users control those magic numbers? Um, and typically, all machine learning systems have avoided this, even if the users are like, even if it's like a machine learning library and the users may be programmers, because typically the assumption here is you're using whatever this is because you don't want to know what a Markov model is. And the magic numbers are in terms of the machine learning system. Um, and the intention in general in interactive systems is try to hide these complex magic numbers from users. Because um, most users don't know anything about hidden Markov models or observation probabilities, et cetera. So we'd like to find a way, in this case, to let users intuitively control those numbers that govern the system in a way that turns those magic numbers, instead of into limitations, into interesting creative degrees of freedom. So my song exposes two magic numbers like this to the users. It, I think you'll see in a second that's actually two seems to be plenty to let people explore a huge variety of um, possible accompaniments for a song. I'm going to show you a quick video again that demonstrates what these numbers are and how they work. And then I'll talk about what they actually are in terms of Because there are many accompaniments that are appropriate for a given melody, my song allows the user to adjust the chords chosen by the system using parameters that are intuitive to non-musicians. One slider bar allows the user to make the accompaniment happier. Someday, when I'm awfully low and the world is cold, I will feel a glow. Or sadder. Someday, when I'm awfully low and the world is cold, I will feel a glow. Just Another slider bar, called the Jazz Factor, allows the user to bias the system toward more Someday, traditional chord patterns when I'm awfully low or more adventurous chord patterns. Someday. And I'm all below. Um, I always know there's musicians in the audience when I show that example, and um, people laugh before I actually um, play the music. 
All right. So I'll tell you, I'm going I'm to explain to you what those two sliders are, but I want to stress it doesn't really matter what those two sliders are. The important thing is we've given the user two sliders <laughs> that you can move around and. Um, and you can, exp a musician takes this for granted. I can sit down with my guitar and I have a melody and I'll try a whole bunch of different chords, but that's actually a lot of kind of black magic happening in a musician's head from the perspective of a non musician. Um, these sliders are our way of giving a non musically trained user just a way to explore that space of possible chords and hopefully turn this into a creative process, right? And be able to correct for the fact that. The first sequence of chords you get back from a model isn't always the best one. Um, it may, it's mathematically optimal, but maybe not what you meant, and maybe not really musically right. Um, so these, there's a couple other things we let people interact with, but these are the main ways of manipulating those chords so that you can find something that you like. And these are, in the 10 minutes that each of our users in our evaluation had to play with their song, they could sing as many times as they want, and most of what they did during that time was just play with these two sliders. Um, so let's talk real quick about what these actually are. Um, uh, I'm going to show you uh, another example of, of what these sliders do, actually, before I get into the details. Um, I'm going to first play a clip created with my song. I, I think lots of you will recognize the song. Sunny day, sweeping the clouds away. On my way to where the air is sweet. Can you tell me how to get, how to get to? OK, so that's, of course, a happy melody. We all expect to hear that happy. But one of the cool things we can do with my song is you can take melodies that you expect to hear one way, either cover songs or if you're a musician. This is actually one of the cool things about my song for musicians is if you write a melody and you come up with chords for it, those are the chords in your head. I mean, it's like so hard to sit down with your instrument and try something different. So this is a, you can take it and just try something totally different. So what we're going to show you now, the same thing. We're going to take the same vocal track. And all we're going to do is turn that happy factor from the right to the left. Isn't, isn't Google Images like the best thing to happen to talks? <laughs> all right. So let's hear again the same vocal track with all I've done is move this slider down. I didn't ruin too many childhoods there. Um, I think I, so. It's, what's really cool to me about that example is um, it's really easy to convince yourself that I just showed you different vocal tracks. It's exactly the same vocal track, um, but to me, it actually sounds like he's singing sadder um, in the second one just because the accompaniment. And the accompaniment is just hardly different. All we changed was the chords, right? We didn't change the accompaniment style at all. And I think it's cool how it actually changes your emotional perception of the voice a little bit. And that, by the way, was Sumit singing, who's the other researcher who worked on this project at Microsoft. Um, okay, so what are the happy factor and jazz factor uh, values that, that we've shown you in the video and exposed to the user? Um, it turns out I actually left that in detail when I described our system earlier. Um, and this is now I'm finally getting to your question about major and minor. Um, before we do any of the training steps that I described, we actually take our entire 300 song database and we partition it into two databases. Um, and we're calling this major and minor songs. It doesn't really matter if they're major and minor songs as long as they're two different databases. Um, and we use an automated clustering routine to do this. We didn't sit down manually and go through all 300 lead sheets and label them as major and minor. Um, the the, I promised you there'd be one tiny, tiny, tiny musical heuristic in all of this talk that we actually coded into my song. Um, in order to seed this clustering process, we use some really basic idea of what a major chord, what a major song might be, or what a minor song be. And it's something really simple like minor songs have more minor chords in them or something like that. And from there, we let a clustering routine automatically separate into two databases and learn other rules that tend to um, separate it into two nice databases, which seem to reasonably reliably represent major and minor songs. Um, we actually go through the whole training process I talked about before. We build a separate chord transition probability matrix for each of those two databases now. Now, when we actually run our hidden markup model when you're using my song, we blend those two transition matrices together according to that slider. So if I turn this slider all the way to the right, the transition matrix my markup model uses is the one I learned from my major database. All the way to the left, minor database, and somewhere in between, I blend those two transition matrices together to make a new transition matrix for my markup model that's a little bit major and a little bit minor. Um, one of the really musically interesting things we learned from this project is it's really not obvious that this should give you a meaningful transition from major to minor, actually. Um, we've been really pleased that it actually this slider tends to very nicely fade from major to minor in a very musical and intuitive way. So people, it's actually very intuitive for people to pick this up right away, even if you have no idea what major and minor mean. What about the jazz factor? So 
somewhere inside my Markov model, when I'm actually running the Viterbi algorithm that I didn't talk about at all, um, I have to compute how well each chord fits at a given position. And this is sort of a little pseudocode version of what that looks like. It's some constant k times some big chunk of um, how likely this chord is given what the user is saying, plus 1 minus k times some big representation of how well this chord fits with the stuff around it. Right? There's two terms here. One match says, how well does this chord match the melody? One says, how much does this chord match the other chords nearby? All we do, this quote unquote jazz factor, which now I'm, I'm giving away our secret, has nothing to do with jazz in any way. All we've done is put this k on a slider. So literally, if you turn, the, so I, I highlight that if we actually exp, like, put my song out to the public, the right 25% and left 25% of this slider would be cut off. But for the slider we're showing you right now, if you move the slider all the way to the right, um, that means that k is 1. And you, we pick chords that mathematically fit what the user sang at each measure and totally ignore the musical sequence of chords. If you move the slider all the way to the left, we igno entirely ignore what the user sang, other than for purposes of determining key. And we pick a reasonable, familiar Western pop sequence of chords in that key. And the happy factor still applies. You can still manipulate it. Um, but that's what the jazz factor does. If anybody has a better name than jazz factor, I, we're all ears. Um, but that was sort of something that people picked up on. And we just say, look, this is a way of, randomly, of exploring the chord space a little bit. Don't think it has necessarily too much to do with jazz. It's, it's another tool you have to try some different chord sequences. And as long as you ignore those extremes at either end, it does, it does that very well. You slide it around a little bit somewhere near the middle, and the chords change, and you get to try something different. Um, OK, that, I, I'm going to stop there, other than showing a couple more examples. I'm going to skip the evaluation section. and let me, I'll, I'll make it a user problem. I'll let you guys think, how would you go about deciding? This is a, kind of a hard HCI problem, right? How would you decide? We just, I told you we've, we've just built something that makes something musical. If it makes, how, how do I convince you? Without showing you a million examples, how do I convince you um, that it doesn't make crap? Right? That's a hard problem from an evaluation perspective. So um, I'm happy to answer questions about it offline. I'm going to show a couple more examples and then take questions and then as much as people want to ask questions about this. So. Doo -doo -doo. Get all that? Everybody get every word of that? Oh, two studies. Oh, now I've left you really excited. There's two studies I just skipped over. OK, I'm going to do a couple more examples. Real quick, again, a little snippet of input. The worst is over now. And we can bring OK, now same thing with chords from my song. The worst is over now, and we can breathe again. I want to hold you high, you steal my pain away. There's so much left to learn. And no It's too sad for me to use here, especially like in a, right after lunch and you're getting, you can kind of like close your eyes and be lost in the sensitive world of that song. All right, do one more. I think. At so. first goodbye, she got on a plane, never to. And this, this is the other example that I promised you where we actually really came up with the original chords to the song. And this is actually a really long section of song that in a, in a way kind of transitions from major to minor. Um, and so I'm, I'm actually sort of somewhere between proud and surprised that this actually pretty much nailed the original chords to the song for this one. At first goodbye, she got on a plane, never to return again, always in my heart. Ba -da -ba, this love has taken its toll on me. She said goodbye too many times before. That's actually a fairly complicated sequence of chords that I got right. It helps that she's an awesome singer. She's like the best singer we, we had. Um, so that probably helped us a little bit. And, um, so, and again, she was probably biased by tweaking those knobs around. And so she was like, yeah, that does sound like the Maroon 5 song. Um, OK, like I said, conclusion really means more audio, which I can skip for now, just because I think an hour and 10 minutes is good. Um, if you have more questions, um, you can email me. I'm dan at microsoft.com. It's really easy to remember. Um, and you can also, this web page has a tr bunch of the examples I showed you and a whole bunch more examples of audio. Um, and some videos that you can take a look at. So that'll uh, be a good time to wrap up for now. <laughs> and now, you guys have been so good at asking questions, there must be more. But I, I will not be offended now. I know it's been a long time, so people can, can wander out as you need to. Yeah. So also, kind of by analogy to natural language, there's often, in, in speech record, for example, you get an end best. 
thought you said bad, but you may have also said both. And there's a gazillion ideas for what the third slider would be. Have you thought about, and this was our top pick, but this was our second yes. pick as the third you, you, slider. You're my hero, Scott. You ask, I love when people ask questions and we can say, yes, we already did that. Um, so this question is, is the, end, the concept of end best list in handwriting recognition is very common, right? You know, if you like use the Windows handwriting recognition, it's like, I think your character was H, but here's some other things it might have been. Um, another thing we can do, which I just didn't show, if you right click on any one of those boxes, you get a little list of what did my song think were the top 10 chords here? And I don't necessarily think of that as, it's not necessarily exactly analogous to the handwriting top 10. It's a great way for a non-musician to explore the concept of chord substitution. What other chords might work there? Even if the best one really is the best, then it works really well. What other things might go well there? Um, that's, that's a really great creative tool. And again, our assumption here is um, you don't know anything about chords. The chords might as well be foreign characters. Um, that's a great way for people to explore the space of chords in a much more targeted, specific way um, without really understanding what they mean. So that we give you a sorted list of the next most likely chords that my song like. <clears throat> To what extent can you make it sort of an online algorithm? So kind of rock band for only people. The question is, could we do this online? Um, and as you can see, there's computationally, there's nothing particularly hard about this. You saw like the slider moving, change the chords in real time. There's nothing particularly computationally demand. Computationally, it's much faster than real time. Um, doing this online becomes a fundamentally different problem, right? Um, if I sing in measure one. I can't play anything, or if I sing in measure four, I can't play anything in measure four until I know what you sang, right? So it becomes a somewhat different problem. I can immediately, I can very, I can trivially come up, if you're in measure four, I can trivially come up with the best sequence of chords for measures one, two, and three, right? For everything I've seen so far, I can. And I could even give you a suggestion for what might make go well in, chord, in measure four, but at that point, I'm kind of telling you what to sing, right? Because if I play a chord for you, you're going to sing on that chord. Um, and I've kind of made it not be you're using the melody to create it, but you're kind of singing along. The Markov model would generalize fairly well there. Um, the other issue with that is the best chord at measure four really depends on measure three and measure five explicitly, and probably on all the measures, at least implicitly, right? The best chord at measure four, we really don't know until you've finished singing. Um, so what I would imagine an ideal interface here is you st it's still nice to have some like feedback that something's happening and it's really listening to me. So I'd like in measure four if it told me the chords in measures one, two, and three, and, they, and I went to measure five and maybe all the ones I've already sung changed, and that was kind of cool visually. But really, the chord sequence isn't finished until you finish singing. Otherwise, it becomes, I think, a pretty different problem. That makes sense? Okay. Any other questions? One more. I was curious how you came up with the idea. Was this one of these, you know, wake up in the middle of the night one day and go, aha, my song? Or was this something that evolved from the initial idea to the final thing? This is, where did the idea come from for my song? Um, this is, honestly, this is pretty close. This is pretty close to the former. This is, I had a pretty specific vision for what I thought was possible. Um, the, the, oh, there's so many, I could, I could, I could spend an hour answering this question. Um, it was clear to me at some point that pitch tracking kind of works. I mean, we didn't invent pitch tracking. We didn't invent the Fourier transform, right? Pitch tracking kind of works. So getting from somebody's voice to kind of some representation of pitch, that's pretty much solved, and I'm not smart enough to make major inroads in, in improving that space. Um, the other end of the problem, going from chords to an accompaniment, there's software that's pretty good at that, right? Um, so a big chunk of this pipeline from scene to song, like, which seems like a whole big complicated piece of magic, was pretty solved, and that's actually a really nice place to be. And it's like, well, it's pretty clear to me. And, and the space in between, going from um, melody, which I'm, I'm strongly using that word melody, since that's not exactly what we have, from melody to chords. Um, and I think this is, this is actually, so uh, that to me as a musician, it seems almost like if you hear a melody and you're a musician, or like a kind of chord-based chord pop rock type musician, it just seems like the chords are there. And everybody might have a different answer to what the chords are. But it, seem, it feels mechanical. Like if you tell me the, um, you give me a melody, I'll give you chords, like right away. And in my mind, I, I, they just like they, they appear there, and this happens to any pop musician. So it seemed like because it has that kind of, it doesn't take a long time. Um, it seemed like that should be something we should be able to reasonably capture, algorithmically. Um, so that sort of seemed like a nice space to work. And it also is interesting, just like the the computer music community in general, I think has been um, the, the a lot of popish musicians think about chords. Like chords are sort of a pretty fundamental representation that pop musicians think about. And um, a lot of work in computer music has for a long time worked on kind of the melody space and the audio space and kind of working on the chord space, there's still been a little bit of a gap there. So it seemed like a nice gap to fill in this pipeline. Is that a sufficiently lo long answer? And, and then the more philosophical answer here is, 
I'm not a pro musician. I'm never going to make money making music. But I love sitting down and writing songs and making music. And like, if other people, if I can give a little bit of that fun to somebody else, then that's a win, right? And just like I was saying to you guys before, if somebody else, like, I don't get painting. I never painted a picture in my life. I totally don't get why it would be fun. But if someone could show me why it's fun without making me spend a lot of money and two years in art classes, I would love that. I'd totally use that and try it. And then maybe I'd pick up painting and maybe I'd love it. So that's kind of like more philosophically, that's like, this is, I get why making music is fun and I would love to be able to show that to more people. So even if I'm not going to make them pick up music as a full-time hobby. So you've talked about this as, as kind of a, a hobby type application and I wonder if this could be used as some phase and actually what, what more of a profession or at least semi-professional musician might do like in the conceptual design. Yeah. Oh, great, great question. The question is, is, um, is, are there applications for my song in a more pro or at least more experienced musician kind of space? Um, absolutely. And the only reason I really talk about the non-musical application first is because it's a bigger audience in the world and it's usually a bigger audience in the audience. Um, for lots of musicians have said they'd love to have this, right? This is never going to replace songwriting. And it is absolutely never going to be used to make a beginning to end finished product of even a you know, semi-professional sounding demo. Um, but there's a lot of things this can do for musicians. Um, if you, first of all, if you're sitting somewhere where you don't have an instrument, a lot of times, so if you're, if you're a songwriter, a lot of pop songwriters are kind of melody first songwriters. You think of a melody, you run for the nearest thing that has a record button on it, and you get that melody down, right? That's you know, your, your cell phone, your whatever. If we could turn that first interaction with a new melody into something where you could actually explore, whether you're sitting on the bus and using this on your cell phone, or you're sitting with your laptop, wherever, and turn that first two minute interaction with your melody into something meaningful where you kind of get a feel for what you might want to do with the song, that's really powerful. Um, another thing this does for musicians is, like I said, sometimes you kind of get a series of chords locked into your head for a melody. Even just hearing this kind of like simple one chord per measure accompaniment can be a great way to just like, look, you're a computer, you don't think the same way I do, tell me something different. I'm going to move these sliders around and just give me something different to think about. Um, so in that sense, it could be really valuable for musicians and, and sum it. The, the other thing is that all, musicians are great songwriters are all over the spectrum as far as how quick they are at coming up with even that first pass of chords. Sumit, the, the other researcher who worked on this, as you can hear, he's a really good singer. He's a great songwriter. He, he's a great piano player. It takes him forever to sit down and come up with chords to go with a new melody. And he, he's the world's only user of my song. He uses it every single day. He writes a melody. He comes up with the chords for it. And that's a great shortcut for him to just get that first, what's a reasonable set of chords that I can start playing and work from? So hopefully that was twice as much data as you wanted for that question. That, so I'm, uh, this is not a question, but I have an idea to make your jazz factor a real jazz factor instead Excellent. of being like a user based and uh, data based. So I mean, I mean each genre, musical genre, uh, reveals very uh, distinct characteristics of chord progression. Jazz uses extensive use of one, four, five. I mean, I mean, almost exclusively. So if you learn the chord uh, transition probabilities from the genre. So if you make a uh, journal dependent HMMs, that will help you a lot. But the problem is, how do you know, how do you obtain these journal specific uh, chord transition uh, probabilities? So, I mean, there are some ways, but uh, for one thing, you can use like a MIDI, MIDI data, which already uh, contains journal information. So that way, you can have like a rock uh, a specific. You said so many interesting things there. I don't know where to start. but. Um, so, so the question largely is, is, can we get towards, so the jazz factor I clearly told you was not really about jazz, right? How can we get towards something that is a little bit more genre specific um, and therefore directly more intuitive to a lot of people? Um, so I actually say that the happy factor actually is a great example. We don't really care whether those two databases are major and minor, right? All it's doing is blending two sets of training data. Um, if we had a training data base for rock and a training database for country, we could have a rock country slider or a 12-way rock country R&B slider. Um, and it would work exactly like the happy factor works now, actually. And that'd be completely straightforward. Um, it's a really interesting musical question. I don't know how much different genres at this level of chord representation really have, really what is specific about genres is in the, can be captured in a chord transition matrix. We have the same question about artists, right? Conceptually, could I give you a Beatles transition matrix? It's not really clear. I mean, the fact is, in a lot of Western popish music, I actually think that the rules of harmony overlap a lot between country and rock and jazz and R&B. Um, and the instrumentation and the singing and the lyrics and the rhythms are really what separate one genre from another. But that's, that's largely my opinion. I, and another great musicology project to do here, to do exactly the same thing, given more training data, which we don't have, 
Um, and you suggested using MIDI data, which is sometimes OK, although rarely are chords nicely labeled in MIDI training data. Um, so conceptually, that works, but we need a really well-kempt MIDI database. Um, the other thing, that, and this gets back, so Scott had a question earlier about sometimes it's the right thing to do to mix some heuristics with some pure data-driven thing. The jazz factor is a great example. I can tell you, to, some, I, like a musician can tell you some things you could do to make something sound more jazz. If that's what we wanted the jazz factor to do, like we, we shouldn't be ashamed to incorporate some heuristics in, right? Like if you're musicians, like if, if more fives turn into sevens or more sevens turn into nines, it will sound more like jazz, right? And then of course you like use the jazz style on whatever your accompaniment system, arrangement generation system is. Um, so there's some heuristics we can do. And I think you could come up with the same kind of things for other genres. Jazz is a great one, though, because adding more extended chords is something that we don't have enough data to do. But we could come up with some pretty good rules and write them down when it might be a good time to use ninths and thirteenths and other things that musicians will associate with jazz. And therefore, and the regular listener will associate with jazz, too. So that, again, good long answer to, to the question you asked. Excellent. Anybody else? All right, we'll wrap up then. I'll stick around for questions. And I will, it'll take me a few minutes, but if people have time, I will set up a demo kind of like once the, the camera shuts off. And I, I'll stick around a while and talk and, and do a little quick demo if people want. So. For information on other online Stanford seminars and courses, please visit study.stanford.edu. The preceding program is copyrighted by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu.